Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, there are a few questions that are asking, you know, about um, my own life, and um, I don't usually talk about myself, um, but I just wanted to say, just to make it clear to you, that Alhamdulillah, um, I embraced Islam myself after 20 years of being a non-Muslim, uh, born in the United States, and I've lived in Canada and Jamaica and Saudi Arabia, and I'm now living in South Africa. And basically, I'm not, you know, I'm a field worker. And, and, and a person doing research and involved in dawah. So that, that's the best way to describe uh, um, uh, myself. I, I wouldn't say convert. We're not using that term. We're saying revert. Because we're actually coming back home again uh, to the original fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us upon. What I would like to say concerning um, the situation of the Muslims here and some of the questions that I have received um, after this lecture is that your response you know, to what I have said uh, is similar to responses that Muslims have had in Canada, in South Africa, in America, and especially throughout the Western countries. And that is that behind the veil uh, of our outward Islam, we are in a great crisis. And we need to look at this in a positive way. We need to look at it as a challenge to, our, to ourselves as Muslims. And, and not to feel depressed and, and, and overcome by it because it is part of the shaitan's way to try to stop uh, Islam and to put out the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abuse is a reality. And for a long time, there has been denial in our community. There are many people who are crying in their homes and they're crying for somebody to stand up against this. And if any Muslim comes uh, uh, in contact with abuse, um, then... The Prophet ﷺ has said, "Men ra'a minkum munkaran Any of you sees evil, then change it with your, his hands. Fa'ilam fabilisani. If he can't do that, then with his tongue. Fa'ilam fabiqalbi wa If he can't change it with his tongue by saying something, go to somebody else, do something to stop it. Then at least you feel it in your heart. But that is the lowest form of faith. And so um, I want to uh, open up the lines, especially with um, the brothers and sisters here in the Islamic organizations, and that those individuals who are interested to set up a social service center, a practical social service center, then inshallah in the future, uh, uh, if Allah gives life, I would be willing to return uh, to sit with the brothers and sisters um, to go over the details about how to set up a functional uh, social service center. Right now, there are individuals who are in the field. And um, the organization of ISNA, Brother Abu Hamza, uh, and Sister Um Shiraz, and others uh, who are standing up, um, they are handling some of these problems. There are other people in other organizations also. So I would say that some of the questions are so deep, some of the points of discussion are so personal that I wouldn't be able to read these things publicly. It has to be handled by a counselor. And so I would uh, request that you call um, to the organization of ISNA, um, and if there are any other uh, uh, social service agencies, they should make themselves known. People who have these skills, they should come forward now to us and to the leadership to try to handle some of these problems. Another great area of questioning um, which I believe that the study circles that, that, that are going on in the different Islamic centers, um, such as ISNA and other places, will handle, especially for the women in terms of their dress, is the fact that um, our dress of modesty, settle aura, covering the private parts, male and female, should um, be practiced in the masjid and outside of the masjid. It's not something that we do when we just make salat and then we, 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 we transform, become these transformers. But we should have one personality, just as we said for the youth, right? Bilal becomes Billy, right? Ali becomes Al, remember that? It can happen for the adults, where Muhammad can become Mo. And he can change up when he goes to the business. Or she could change up also after she finishes making salat. And so, 
Um, it is recommended, Sheikh Nasr al-Din al-Albani rahimahullah, uh, who wrote a book, Hijab al-Mar'ah, al-Muslima, the, the hijab of the, the, the Muslim woman is one of the, uh, uh, the best summaries with clear delil to show the limits in terms of the dress. And it shows that um, it is permissible for a woman to expose her face and her hands. However, uh, those women who are covering uh, more than that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. And they are actually in line with the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And um, it is permissible in Islam to do that. The clothing that we do wear, if we are covering our bodies, and if the man is covering from above his navel uh, to below his knee, uh, and especially in Salat, he's covering over his chest, uh, our clothing should not be see-through. And it should not be skin tight. You know this spandex generation that I was talking about, uh, where people are actually covered up but they're naked. This is right in line with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ who predicted that, that these days would come. So it should not be skin tight, it should not be uh, 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 you know, shining, shining colors. Uh, it should not be, a woman shouldn't be cut, having perfume and going outside, which is, which is uh, attracting uh, to the men. And we should not be following Allah blindly and apishly after the styles of the Westerners, or, or of the Kafirun. And really, East and West has, has ended now, it's global now. We shouldn't be following the non-Muslims in their fashions. But we should be strong enough to stick to our own fashions and our own styles in a sense, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to be as simple and as humble as we can uh, in our dress. Also concerning work, this is a question that is coming up constantly, and there may be different opinions uh, that scholars have. The ideal situation, um, if we have our own territories and our own lands, is that basically the responsibility of providing for the family is really on the man. And so he is the one who is burdened to go out to work. We don't necessarily look at work as being a privilege, or work as being you know, the means of worth of an individual, because you go out and work in a factory. And so modesty has to be maintained. And, and, and those families where the man is basically taking care of the responsibility and, and fulfilling his rights, these are the families that have the most success. When the man takes part of his responsibility, and he puts it on his wife, makes her go out to work, he forces her to go out to work, and then he comes home and he, and he thinks he wants to be the king of the house. It doesn't work like that. Because that was his responsibility, the nafaqa was on him. He was supposed to do it. But we have the case of a man who goes out to work, and he comes back, um, his wife com comes back at 4.30. She had to work. She goes to the factory. She arrives at 4.30. He arrives at 5.30. He kicks his feet up on the chair. Where's my food? Okay? Now she turns around. She's been listening to the women's liberation all day at the factory. And she says, you cook the dinner. And then it's World War III. <laughs> so the problem develops. Why are you forcing her to go out to work? That's not her responsibility. Even if you look at Sharia, technically speaking, it's not even her responsibility to be doing household chores. If you really look into the Sharia, you'll find that. Now we know with a division of labor, more than likely she would be. But it's not actually her responsibility. She has to take care of the children. She nurtures the children. She, 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 she takes care of, makes the, uh, care that the children are standing on their feet. Okay? So really, these are the families that are the most successful. Also now what is happening, we need expertise in the Muslim community. We need to have Doctor, female doctors, we need to have teachers, we need to have a number of, 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 of professional jobs to be done by women. How are they going to get this knowledge? We don't have the ideal situation. And so, um, and Allah knows best, and you may get different opinions on this, but if a woman is, 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 is able to continue wearing her, her Islamic uh, dressing, her clothing, she's covering herself, she's able to make her salat, she is not sacrificing her deen, and she is going out to, you know, to do a study that is needed by the community, not just to make money. Then, you know, with protection and, and, you know, and, and with support of the community, um, um, we have been allowing the sisters to do this, um, because we had the case of people who were saying um, they did not want the, 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 the sisters to go out to university at all. In the second breath, the brother said, 
I want a, a, a female doctor for my wife, a Muslim. So I said, okay brother, if you want a female Muslim doctor, who's supposed to learn this? Or, or where are you going to get her from? If she doesn't go to the university to learn medicine, you see? So therefore we have to use hikmah and we have to balance ourselves until we move towards the level where we have our own society, our own state, you know, then, we can, then our, our, our division of labor you know, can be easier for us because we will have this type of setup. So we have to use wisdom when we are doing this. But in the event that, that a woman has to sacrifice her deen, then it is not worth going out to the kafirun because there are many problems that are happening on the jobs, sexual problems, even non-Muslim women have been uh, complaining about abuse and rape and all types of things that are going on outside of the society. The men also need to consider covering their auras. And this is a problem that has happened in our community. And I see that it also could exist here, where the men are so particular about the women, covering their aura, and then they bend down to make salat, and their shirt is way up on their back, their pants are so tight, you can see their whole bodies, and you know, they are wearing any type of clothing that they want to wear. So the covering of the aura and modesty and lowering the gaze is for male and for female. Concerning the, the, the government in Afghanistan and in any part of the world, I would recommend that you get somebody from Afghanistan or somebody who has been in Afghanistan to answer this question for you. Because it is not fair for anybody to, to make a comment about Muslims if you don't have direct information. You'll hear positive, you hear negative. We used to say in America though, that if the CNN, if those people in so-called authority are against you, then you must be doing something right. You must be doing something right. So um, I, I would suggest for this question to be answered properly, we need to get somebody who's been inside the country and, and really knows uh, what is going on, who can answer this, this question properly. You'll notice that in terms of the war against Muslim women, I didn't go into details concerning what is happening with the West. Because I think it is very clear to us in terms of the, the media attacks, in terms of physical attacks in France and other parts of the world, what is going on. We're seeing it all the time. But, but the struggle of the internal Muslims, that is the one that we haven't really brought out into the open. And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would help us, because you know, as we say in America, the cat is out the bag. And so we need to now deal with this situation and, and, and come away from denial and try to stay as close as we can to the Sunnah of the Prophet and we have to ask Allah to forgive us because we're living in uh, as mustadafin we are living outside of an Islamic state and we are, we are in a state of weakness and we have to ask Allah to make it easy for us that we can move closer and closer toward the Sharia in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the praying of the women inside of the masjid um, you know, this is a question that has come up and um, a number of people asked about this. And we have in, in South Africa, and I don't know if it's here too, there are some masjids who don't even have a space for the women to pray inside of. And really the Prophet ﷺ said a number of different hadiths. لَا تَمْنَعُوا نِسَاعَكُمْ مَسَاجِنْ وَبَيُوتُهُنَّ خَيْرٌ لَهُنَّ Or كَمَا قَالَيْ سَاتُوا السَّلَامِ This rewire comes in many different ways. Do not prohibit women from coming to the masjid, but their homes are better for them. Now some... Uh, our scholars will, will just give you the second part of the hadith. And they say their homes are better for them. Okay? But it is saying don't prohibit them from coming to the masjid. Now, we don't have time to go into details and the classes can handle the details. But the key point is, the asl is, the masjid or the basis is, the masjid should have a place for women. And if there is peace in the land, if, if, if it is possible for them to come out, they should be able to come out, to, to enter with their own entrance, and to have a place in the masjid where they can pray. And especially in these countries, it is preferable for women to go sometimes to, 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 to the jama'ah, to hear the, the khutbah, to come around Muslims, because our homes are no longer islands of Islam. That television, that, that one-eyed beast inside of the house, is actually making our homes like, the, 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 like places of kufa of disbelief. If however there is fitna, if there is danger in the land, if there is some uh, uh, force, some evil which, which can harm the, the, the faith of the women or, or, or put them in danger, 
then it is permissible for the leadership to ask them to stay home. And we see this in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, and you'll see it in some other points in Islamic history, but the basis is they should be allowed to go to the masjid, and if it's possible to have classes in the center, right? It is fairly peaceful, it seems to be fairly peaceful here in the city, then it is encouraged that there are as many uh, activities for the sisters as possible, so that they can be educated, and they can be part of the Islamic movement, and especially in da'wah, sisters should be trained in the da'wah as well. Because if a woman accepts Islam, like last night, who's going to teach her? The brothers? Many brothers would like to teach her. <laughs> but the problem is, that's where the shaitan can come in, right? That's dangerous. So if she, if she embraces Islam, if we have sisters who are trained, who know the da'wah, who know the fiqh, then, then, then she can be processed into Islam in the proper way, and she's protected. Instead of our nafs al-amara bisu, to be handling her, on her first days within Islam. Another question um, uh, is saying that um, is a female Khalifa possible? And um, these are a little bit far away from the topic that, that I gave, but basically um, uh, the, the, the Khilafat is basically handled by, uh, by, the, by, by men. And um, uh, it is a position um, that requires the leading of Salat, and that requires the leadership of the male community as well as the female of the whole society. That the focus of the society is on the leader. And so um, you will find that, that the fuqaha basically made one of the conditions of the khalifa is that, that he is male. Also in terms of women involved in singing and nasheeds, then, then it is uh, 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 the, the, the Islamic position that they should not be singing openly uh, in public. If they are making statements, you know, which are, that do not have a voice, that is a singing voice, then, then in some cases there is allowed to be uh, uh, exchange between male and female because it, it is reading so, is something Islamic uh, or, um, you know, it is not dealing with, um, you know, singing and, and, and that changing of the voice. So it, it is the Islamic position for them not to be involved in that. Um, there's another question which is dealing with a sister who, whose husband is a revert and still new in the deen, and he has fluctuations in, in his iman. And she is unsure whether he will be a, a good, strong Muslim or not. Um, what I would like to say is that um, being born a Muslim isn't necessarily the criteria of success in this world. In some countries, some people believe that if you're born in a Muslim family, then you're a real Muslim. If you're not born in the Muslim family, then you're sort of like in one day and out the other day. Iman rises and falls. And all of us are subject to points where our Iman is high and at points where our Iman is low. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, were not Muslims. Umar ibn Khattab used to drink alcohol and, and torture Muslims. But he, he became one of the greatest Muslims in Islamic history. And so therefore it is not a criteria uh, whether that person is born as a Muslim, whether he will be successful or a good husband. He has to be treated like anybody else. He has to be given nasiha, and, and if there is a continued problem with him, this is where the wali comes in. The wali in the marriage is not just to sign the contract and to give away his daughter or his sister or his niece or whatever it is. The wali should be watching that marriage. And if she's having a problem, call in the wali. Call in the imam. Call a counselor. Talk about it. The important issue, one of the important uh, uh, ways of coming out of our problems today, we need to discuss the problem. We need to establish shura, where we discuss the issues openly. We, we open up the book of Allah, open up the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> and use this as the base. And, 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 and deal openly. Don't hold things inside of yourself. Because when it, it, you hold it in yourself, this is when abuse comes. And this is when the shaitan, iyadu billah, gives the person more strength to do evil because you don't stand up to that person. You have to stand up. Allah is the one who controls life and death. And, 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 and the family members should remember, when you give your daughter in marriage, you're not giving her away and, and, and as though she's dead, she's gone. This is in Hinduism. They put the dot on the head and they're gone. This is not our concept. 
It continues on, the relation continues on. And you have to protect her. And if there is a sister who has accepted Islam and does not have a wali, the Prophet ﷺ said, As Sultan wali men la wali Allah. That the Sultan or the authority, the ruler, or, or, or the people in authority in the area should uh, assign people who are married to be the walis for the sisters who are, 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 are new Muslims. This is a very important institution that must develop in the community to protect them. So the family plays a role after the marriage. There was one brother uh, who came from the Sudan actually, and um, he said that uh, in his village, when the man or his family, what they used to do, if the man was going to marry somebody in their family, they bring him for dinner. And then he sits down with the men and she serves the food. Okay, so then he, his contact is made. Okay, so he sees her serving the food and, you know, and the brothers and the, f the father is there. After uh, um, they're finished and, and the agreement is made, yes, he wants to marry her, yes, she wants to marry him, then the men take him and, and they beat him up. Now, they don't break his bones, but they just give him a little force, right? They give him some force. And the father says, if you touch my daughter, this is what you're going to get. <laughs> so he never forgets. He never forgets for the rest of the marriage. <laughs> Western society tells us that polygamy in Islam is against the way of things. Please explain. This issue of ta'adda the zawjat, of, of marrying more than one wife, a man marrying more than one wife, um, you know, is something which is ma'loom, uh, uh, bidurora. It's something we should know in Islam. It's, it's a base, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it permissible for a man to marry uh, four women. But the, the condition is justice. He must be able to, to, to do justice in the marriage. If he can't do justice, then he should only marry one. And so, this is the basis in Islam, and this is not a point of discussion, whether it is permissible or not. What is the point of discussion is whether the brothers are capable of doing it or not. And in many cases, unfortunately, they're not capable. And abuse has happened within our community. But this should not deny those relationships that are really meaningful relationships, which are, uh, 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 which, you know, which are plural marriages. It is possible to have meaningful relationships. And um, we have to now move closer toward the Islamic model of things. At the same time, we have to be sensitive to, to, to the problems of the society, the, the economic problems, the psychological problems, the cultural problems, before a move like that is made. And this is where counselors come in. This is where marriage education comes in. What happens many times, we have the wrong concept of marriage when we go into the marriage. We also have our own cultures, and we expect certain things of, of a, woman or a woman or a man in our cultures. But in another culture, it may not be like this. So we have to have marriage counseling. And it would be important to establish a service where, where the people sit with the imam or with somebody before they get married, and they're counseled before they actually go into the marriage and try to understand something about the culture of the person who you're marrying. Um, is it permissible uh, to take or give uh, a gift for a woman who is not a close, or a lift for a woman who is not a close relative alone in my car? The Prophet ﷺ said that if you're alone, if you go outside, uh, uh, you know, if a man and a woman go outside together, then the third party is shaitan. So, um, whether you're in a car or whether you're walking in the woods, whatever it is, the shaitan can penetrate your car even if it is a BMW. <laughs> he can penetrate it. So therefore, you should not be alone. Don't be alone. Always have uh, the third party uh, when you're carrying somebody who is not mahram, who is not within your, uh, your, your close relationship. Um, you mentioned that a woman should have their own property. In the case of separation, uh, to have their own, uh, here they will have 65% of the assets um, uh, you know, when, when the divorce comes on. Now, this may be a problem because now there's a difference between the Sharia law and, and the law in the society. And what happens now, another point which is very uh, essential for success in marriage is that when we're being married, you should have 
in your contract, shurut, conditions. So you are allowed to write in certain conditions. And so what, has ha- what happened in some of our marriages is that the people wrote in the conditions that in the event of separation, our wealth would be divided up according to Islamic law. And so they put this with a lawyer as a, a condition, a legal condition that they signed for, an affidavit that they signed for um, before they got married, and that was, you know, they were able to use that in Canada. I'm not sure whether that is possible here, but it is something that needs to be explored with a lawyer. Okay, there is another question that is saying, uh, you said that one should not make a joke of divorce. What happens if a husband and wife act in a drama together? <laughs> in a scene, the husband divorces his wife. Please, that's the first time I ever heard that one. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is Australia. It's allowable in Australia or something. I don't know. Um, really, talak is serious, man. Talak is serious. And, 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 and I would even avoid in a drama. Because the hadith is saying, you say it in joke, it's serious. So, you know, if, you know, have somebody else in that drama to be the one you say talak to. Don't even say it in joke. This is how serious that word is. Uh, Another question uh, is saying, uh, how do you stand up against a government, non-Islamic, who is starting a war against women wearing the veil? Are there any human rights associations which Muslim women can refer to uh, help in, in similar matters? Okay, um, uh, this is a problem that we're facing. This is where unity is important. And there may be different approaches to Islam. There may be groups that emphasize different aspects of Islam. But we are all under Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Then we should be able to at least unite and have a, a major umbrella of organizations or imams who can come together and put the you know, questions on the table and, and have unity for certain issues. And, and, and when it comes to uh, any government attacking Muslims, the community needs to unite and go in the streets. Have your own lawyers. Ha- have your pressure groups. There is a group in America called CARE. C-A-I-R-R. And they are doing an excellent job in terms of if Muslims are having problems on the job, then this is a, an organization that has lawyers. It has public relations people. And so if, for instance, there is a statement of discrimination against Islam at a factory. Then the care will then contact you know, the head of the factory and will complain to them and will demand that those, that statement be taken back and will threaten court action or demonstration. And it is proven to be highly successful within the society because many times the reason why Muslims are under attack is because nobody will stand up for them. No, there's no organization to do that. So it is advisable for a defense organization to be set up you know, where Muslims can have that type of uh, protection. And it's a legal thing, it's an open thing, it's nothing that has to be hidden, it's not an underground terrorist group that's going to blow up the building or anything like that. It's out front. Right? And, and it's very important to help our brothers and sisters. It says, brother, uh, we have a problem when it comes to brothers taking their wives out. Uh, can you comment on this issue? Well, you know, um, really, um, brothers should spend more time with their families. And I know it's nice to be with the boys and to, to play ping pong and talk and, you know, whatever it is. But really, it is a responsibility. It's a responsibility of the husband to spend some time with his wife and with his children. The Prophet ﷺ was the best example, right? He used to run races uh, 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 with, with his wife, especially Aisha radiallahu anha. He used to sew his own clothes. Can you sew, brothers? He used to sew. Right? He used to sweep the floor, right? Play with children, be part of the house. And he was receiving revelation from above seven heavens. And so if he can do that, why can't we spend time? Quality time. Put it into your schedule to spend quality time with your family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will give you a great reward. Uh, Another question is saying, my sister was informed of her divorce to a solicitor without her knowledge of a divorce and even without a previous problem. Uh, How come an Islamic Islamic court in in an Arabic country accepts this? Is this divorce halal? Okay, um, this is really something that needs to be handled. All of the details need to be 
I handle but but the talaq I mean the, it should be you know said it, it is a lafz it, it is saying it um, and at least her wali you know or, uh, or herself somebody should have heard this um, but really for the details of this you really need to s- sit down with an imam you know to, to really look at the situation and, and, and everything that is being involved um, <clears throat> It says, I understand the concept of segregation, but should there be a wall so that sisters can't even see the Imam in Jummah? You know, really, um, to be honest with you, in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, there was no physical barrier. That was the best generation. Of course, they had taqwa and self-control. Now, <clears throat> according to the society, you know, some people would have, you know, a complete uh, wall. Some people would have a half one where the sister could see from the top she could see the imam but, but it covers the, the bottom right? in the masjid we had we had a section where sisters could be totally separated and we had another half one where if they sit down they could see uh, the imam but, but the, their bottoms were covered okay? that, that's one way out of it in one masjid I was in though I found out what the problem was because I was wondering why are these brothers you know, you know, pushing this issue we were in this place called the Jami Mosque and, and the sister, who, somebody who's here from Toronto uh, knows what I'm talking she, She's from the Jami Mosque. You see it tonight. And um, so the mosque was a church before. And the, brother, uh, the sister's section was high up on the right. Way up. Okay? And so the brother's, the Qibla is this way. So the brother said to me, Brother, you've got to put up a veil on top of that. Cover it off. It's a fitna. So I said, okay, it's a fitna. Um, the, the Qibla is that way, man. You know, you're telling me that it's a fitna, right? Then one day, I came and I saw him sitting on the stairs, looking up at the sisters. <laughs> okay? So the problem was, his qibla was upstairs. <laughs> See? And secondly, he needs a veil on his own eyes. <laughs> that was the solution to his problem, man. You see, so many times what we do, we sort of like, you know, pass, the, we, we, we blame the, the sisters for everything. Brothers, you, you know, lower your gaze, man. Lower your gaze. That's what we're supposed to do. Lower your gaze. Another question is saying, uh, brother, what character or clock should we look for in a man to ensure we won't be oppressed by them after marriage? Um, it's important for the, 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 the wali or somebody, whoever is responsible for the sister, to really sit down with this uh, brother who is about to be married and, and have discussions with him. And it is allowed with a chaperone or a, or a third party, even for them to, 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 to go somewhere and to talk, as long as somebody else is there, once the intention is made. Now, from t- country to country, it might vary. But some of the Sahaba, you know, there's reports of the Sahaba were even allowed to, you know, one, he, he, he hid behind a tree and he watched her, uh, you know, cleaning and cooking and stuff like that. So, so some contact is allowed, but um, you know one of the one of the things that, that we did is that you know we had enough discussions that we saw we, we you know the person who was the wali disagreed with the, with the brother, and in disagreement when he starts arguing with you, then you start to see something about his personality, because many people can be very nice and, and calm, and but when you disagree with them they change, so. That needs to be checked out. The person's history needs to be checked out, right? And you can't just say, "Oh, mashallah, tabarakallah, You know, his, his hair is so nice, and he, he says the hadith so nice. You can't do that, yeah, because you don't know the person's background. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Al ajala min al shaitan." Haste is from the devil. So therefore, you need to have. Uh, uh, you know, before you're getting married, you need to check out the history of the male and the female. Even now, and I'm sorry to say it, we need to check out each other's medical history. You have to take blood tests, man. Unless you know that family completely. Because unfortunately, with HIV being around, it's spreading all over the place. And I had a case, this is a real case, where the brother was out in the dunya and he was, you know, you know playing around and everything, and then he became Islamic. And then he was telling everybody, you know, your pants is too uh, low, low and your beard. And you know, he was the model Muslim brother now. Okay? And then he comes to me and he said, Brother Abdullah. And he was a doctor. This is the fitna and the, and the, and the test that he was under. 
He said, when I was out in society, I contracted genital herpes. He had herpes, okay, which is contagious. And he said, um, but I want to get married, and uh, should I tell my wife before I'm married? I said, brother, what are you going to do, man? He's going he's gonna to go all the way and, and get her, and she's just about ready to, to say, I do. And he says, oh, by the way, <laughs> I happen to have a contagious disease. No, he has to, you know, on both sides, you need to be very clear and open with the medical history. And again, this is where the wali comes in uh, to help uh, in the marriage. It says we have lots of resources and organizations in Melbourne. How can we unite these organizations beyond the, uh, the diversity and where should the unity stop? Uh, and as I was saying, it's important for us to have you know, some sort of medjilis ashura. And if there are certain issues that affect the whole community, then Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, we need to be able to come together. Even though there may be different emphasis that we have. We're all part of the same ummah. We're part of the millah. And, and, and we need to be able to overcome uh, some of the minor differences and certain issues. That doesn't mean that we have to be together in everything. Because there are some groups that are, that are more serious about Islam than others. But at some point, we have to realize that we are part of the same ummah. And Allah knows best. Um, in terms of boys and girls being mixed in the classroom, um, really, you know, the, uh, when, when, when the children are very young, um, what has generally happened in the Islamic schools, when the children are very young, especially like under seven years old or something, then some of the schools will mix. But once they reach seven, and especially going up by eight, nine, and ten, at that point there should be uh, a complete separation. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Especially when you know, you're in the teenage phase of life. It does not work. And so the Islamic education, you know, is like that. It gives us the freedom of being in the classrooms and not have to deal with the physical changes that, that each gender is going through at that time. It says, um, <clears throat> if your husband swears at your parents, uh, what does the religion say about that? Or should you stay with him or not? Of course, he shouldn't be you know, doing that. Um, it's not necessarily, I mean, of course, we have to see the gravity of the situation. It's not necessarily grounds for divorce, but it's a serious problem. And a counselor should immediately come in. Because something is seriously wrong. If he's disrespecting your parents, then how can he respect the woman herself if he disrespects her parents? Because she's part of the parents. And this concept that the, that the woman or the man, or the woman especially, you know, when she's married, he owns her now. Like he owns a horse. That's not Islamic. She's a, she's a free individual. She has her rights under the law of Islam. And she has independence in Islam. It says um, <clears throat> also, uh, my husband always argues about religion. If I get him a hadith, he'll argue until I get him the proof. Okay, um, it's nothing wrong with, with him arguing, uh, debating. Of course, it shouldn't be an angry argument. Okay, but if he wants Dalil, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with asking for Dalil. But he should also put himself in the position, if he says do something, then she could say, can I have Dalil? Right? Let, you know, let, I mean, if that's what he's going to do for everything that she's saying. You see, one of the key issues in marriage is understanding. If there is understanding between the individual, if you love each other for Allah, and not just because physical reasons, not just because we're in the same tribe, or he has a lot of money, or she has a lot of money. If you're in Islamic work, if you're praying together, and you have an understanding, you can overcome a lot of these problems. But if the marriage is based on material things, on physical beauty, then the shaitan has free reign to the household. And so we, we all have to review our marriages and, and really try to come closer together. Do things together Islamically. Travel you know, to, to Umrah and Hajj together. Go to Masjid al-Aqsa together. Witness what is happening to the Muslims. Do something in, in organizations helping the children of Iraq or Afghanistan. Do things together Islamically and then love will, will come in between you. If the, if the relationship is only based on Hayat dunya how much money did you make this week? Right? How pretty do you look in the mirror? And all these things. Then the shaitan will, will, will easily have rain inside of your house. It said, my husband is married to another sister secretly uh, from me and people. Uh, if he, 
secretly from me and, and people. If he is a man, why didn't he tell me? <laughs> we have five children. Uh, we're on welfare. And he's working part time. Okay, really, you know, um, technically speaking, it's not a, a condition of marriage that he has to inform uh, his first wife. However, um, it shouldn't be a secret marriage. Because in marriage there is i'lan, there is announcement. So it should be known, it should not be a secret marriage. Why would he marry anyway secretly? Why is he doing that? So it, it, it's not Islamic for him to be having a secret marriage. Nobody supports secret marriages. It's not part of nikah in Islam. However, um, it isn't really a condition. It's not a condition for him to ask, you know, to, to, for his wife to, 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 to agree, you know, when he marries another wife. However, it is the wisdom, uh, it, it is the understanding of Islam that, that he should discuss this with his family, even discuss it with her wali or whatever, and, 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 you know, have good reasons why he's doing that. If he's doing it secretly, then something must be wrong. You know, and, and really, the wali again should step in uh, uh, to handle this problem. Um, in terms of, the, there's a sister who knew somebody who recently was abused. And um, this is where I, I would advise you to, to contact the authorities, uh, those in the organizations who are, are, are dealing with um, the, the Islamic issues. Um, okay, a lot of the questions are repeating themselves. It says, um, I'm a girl and I have one year from finishing school. I want to go back to my country and not to stay in this country. I came without, without a mahram before and I don't have one now. Is it permissible? Okay, um, you know, it is, if it is, uh, uh, you know, it is the Islamic way that, that, that she travels with the mahram. Some cases there is a type of darora, uh, a, type of, a type of necessity that happens, where she could be taken to the airplane by, by somebody, and then the other people meet her on the other side of the airplane. Um, however, it is you know, the, you know, the, the, the most preferable, the Islamic way, that, that somebody from, from the family should come to travel with her uh, when she travels back, or she travels with uh, maybe a group of sisters or something like this. This, this is the preferable uh, Islamic way, Allahu Alam. Um, the one question is saying how to stop this type of social uh, service organization um, that I was, I was speaking about. And this, alhamdulillah, in this community, from what I understand, it has already begun. There are people who are doing counseling now, putting the, the mountains on their back, listening to the problems. And this is where professional people, if you're a Muslim, you're a social worker, or you're a doctor or a lawyer, you should contact the leadership in ISNA and other organizations. Give, your, give some of your time to the community. Some of the lawyers in our area would even give free counseling to some of the Muslims. Okay, some of the doctors would even give free care to some of the Muslims. We have to you know, dedicate some of our time to our community, because in many cases, it was the community that helped you to get where you are. So, professionals should come forward uh, 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 to deal with these problems you know, that are happening with, with our, in, in, in our community. Um, also, in terms of, uh, of, of, of generally in the Dawah, um, I encourage that the brothers and sisters also to begin to, you know, uh, in, a, in, a more, in, a, in an organized fashion, I know it's happening already, to, to, to try to work together. Alhamdulillah, the group in Islam has, you know, signs and they're coming out in the public, but this dawah needs to go openly. And we need to have more uh, programs in the open and go e even into the reservations, to the aboriginal people, and, and, and to spread this, this message, uh, you know, to everywhere in this island, inshallah. The last point I wanted to make, um, this was a very uh, beautiful statement that the brother has said, and I wanted to, to end uh, 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 with this. And the brother said, Assalamu alaikum, I am a man destined to change my ways. I have for too long thought wrongly about women. They are the jewels of Islam. I ask for forgiveness and I promise to treat my wife as an equal. Nothing more and no nothing less. And hopefully she won't use her Tai Chi on me. <laughs> And, you know, he, he, he thanked uh, uh, the organizers uh, for this session tonight. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept you uh, uh, in this uh, 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 statement that you have made. May Allah accept your, your tawbah for anything that has gone wrong. 
And may Allah forgive us all for what we are saying and what we are doing and bring us together as a community. May Allah have mercy upon this ummah and protect the honor and dignity of the women of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.